I'm more than pleased to introduce our moderator for today, Omar Aljindi. Omar is the founder and chief executive officer of Badia Farms, a pioneering and revolutionizing agricultural initiative to provide a sustainable solution for the region's future. A Saudi national and qualified industrial engineer, Omar began his career in the financial and engineering industries in Saudi Arabia before following his entrepreneurial passion. This led to a successful business in hospitality and recognition in the 2007 book leaders of Saudi Arabia. Omar, you can come take the stage now. Thank you. Thank you, Palani, for the introduction. And thank you, Taya Dubai, for hosting this uh, exciting uh, event uh, and a panel. We've got uh, diverse uh, panels with us today. I'll start with introducing them. Lama Fawaz, the CEO of Oasis 500. Reem Al-Franji, co-founder and managing partner of, of Habaibna.net. And Rama Kayali, CEO and co-founder of Little Thinking Minds. Uh, please, Lama, if uh, you can start with introducing yourself and then we'll pass the mic to Reem and Rama. Sure, thank you, Omar. Um, first of all, thank you, Omar, for, for the introduction. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, thank you, Tai Dubai, for organizing this session. Um, so my name is Rima Fawaz. I'm the CEO of Oasis 500. For those that are not familiar with Oasis 500, it's an early stage investor and accelerator out of Jordan. Oasis invests um, and supports founding teams at the very, very beginning of their journey. Um, we invest in uh, technology sector and are sector agnostic. We are impact focused as well. To date, we have invested in 176 startups, uh, all of which have gone through our investment readiness program. It's a six months program that continue, we continue to enhance as we reflect on our learnings and market conditions. Um, I'm gonna stop here. I would like to share with you some numbers that are relevant to, to our session, uh, just to you know, ignite the discussion and allow um, uh, my, my colleagues to uh, introduce themselves. Um, so out of the 176 of these startups are founded or co-founded of 900 high caliber jobs out of which 35% are female. And Oasis 500's team is 80% female. Numbers that we're very, very proud of. Uh, I'll, uh, back to you, Omar. Thank you, uh, Luma. Uh, Rama, please, can you uh, give us a quick introduction about the work uh, you've been doing? Uh, you've had a long journey, exciting journey. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Amar, and thank you, Thai Dubai, for this opportunity. Uh, okay, my name is Rama Kayali, and I am co-founder and CEO of Little Thinking Minds. We are uh, We are uh, an edtech company. We focus on creating Arabic language literacy tools to improve Arabic learning outcomes for millions of children uh, in the region and globally. We started our journey first out of passion. We were wanting to solve a pain that we had as young mothers, um, with young kids who had no access to Arabic language tools or engaging tools. And the dream grew. And as, as it grew, we also started growing the company. Um, we started creating DVDs and VHS videos. And now we have online platforms um, for 200,000 students in 10 countries uh, in 280 schools. We are a team of 60. And we are also 65% women. We have a large team of women. We are an Oasis portfolio company. So they were the first investors in us. Um, and uh, we'll share more as, as we go along. Thank you. Great, great. Thank you, and Reem. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you, Amal. And thank you, Tai Dubai, again. And actually, I was a runner up with, from the, the last competition that Tai Dubai uh, made uh, in the MENA region. And uh, so I'm um, the co-founder and managing partner of Habayibna.net. It's a digital platform specialized um, in the intellectual and developmental disabilities in Arabic. We empower parents by providing them easy access to uh, connect with specialists in specialization and rehabilitation. And we provide specialized content that is verified also by specialists. We have uh, a public library and we do online courses. The idea of Habayibna.net came out of um, our own experience, me and my husband, who is my co-founder. Uh, so we have two sons with 
disability need guidance and support all the time, all the way. So we uh, initiated Habit, we launched Habit Ibn in December 2017. And now we're, now currently we are in the acceleration program of Oasis 500, and we're so happy with the, with the guidance and support and the mentorship that we're having. Great, thank you, Reem, for there's a strong connection with Oasis 500. That's, that's <laughs> fantastic, there's a big impact. Um, I'll, I'll start with you, Lama. I have, um, uh, you know, when I was preparing for the session, uh, there's a study conducted by the global female leaders that shows there are 32 million young women that are unemployed. Uh, and if their potential were to properly uh, put to use, the, the added value could amount to $50 billion annually. Uh, that's in the Middle East region. So uh, if, if you can share with us what's holding uh, women, young women, uh, of joining uh, the entrepreneurial space. Thank you, Omar. Uh, that's the reason we call them uh, the hidden talent. They're, you know, uh, really they bring so much to the table and they're unaware of that. Um, so just to, the, to your point, uh, let me just share with you a couple of more numbers, uh, um, just, you know, to make sure that you understand uh, the level of, of, of awareness that we need to create to encourage these females to, um, you know, go to the workforce, apply for entrepreneurship, etc. So I'm just going to talk to you about the last two years only, right? Um, we've received in the last two years 1,900 applications, right? 13 of which, so it's a function of the funnel. Imagine you're looking at the funnel and the top, the top is 1,900 in terms of numbers. We've received that number of applications, 13% of which are female. So we have an issue with the number of females at the top funnel. After the first line of screening, 22% of the companies that actually make it um, are female. Going down further, 30% of the selected startups are female, which goes to tell you that the success rate of them actually passing through all the selection process is really, really high. But the issue is they're not applying. And why are they not applying? Despite, you know, as, uh, you know our marketing, uh, you know, uh, uh, hacks, uh, trying to, you know, create awareness and call them in and encourage them, they are not applying. And it goes back, and maybe Reem and Rama can, you know, elaborate, but it goes back to the level of confidence. It goes back to the risk tolerance, uh, uh, you know, the perception of risk, the perception of uh, taking an investment, the perception of having this work-life balance. So, you know, it's, 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 it's a combination of factors. And, and these applications, the thousand hundred, are mostly from Jordan or all over the Middle East? That's all, Jordan only. Oh, Jordan only. Okay. Good to know. So there must be a lot of hidden talent then around the Middle East. I like what you're saying. Reem, if you can shed some light on what was your experience? What really pushed you into becoming an entrepreneur? And, uh, and then we'll get to the part where you chose your husband as your co-founder. Yeah. <laughs> so so, so, yeah. so Reem, Reem just, just for me to clarify. So Reem was one of the 30% the, the that actually passed through that funnel, right? Yeah, yeah, and actually there is something interesting that uh, when we started uh, Habayibna in, uh, in 2018 and we applied for Oasis, we couldn't make it because we were not ready. Uh, and um, actually at that time, uh, when we started Habayibna, I had the fear that uh, I thought technology, technology is something only for men that uh, what, uh, who am I to, uh, you know, to, to do something in technology, especially my background is in nonprofits, projects management, but I, I, I knew what I wanted exactly. Uh, and then when I wanted to find a partner who, who shares the same passion, who has the same experience like mine, I uh, realized that he is very, <laughs> very close to me. He was my husband and we had a big fear actually me and my husband uh, to become partners and to have this joint venture but after i uh, you know sat down with myself and i started asking myself questions what is really uh, that i'm afraid of uh, why wouldn't he uh, why wouldn't my husband become my partner especially he has the skills that i needed at that time as a co-founder uh, so I started to, you know, break down the things that uh, I thought 
uh, were mysterious and my fears and the things that um, I wanted to find some questions, some answers for them. And I started profiling. Uh, okay, if I wanted a co-founder, what is the profile of this co-founder? And I found, you know, many common, uh, you know, uh, things in my husband. So we came together and when we came together, because we had the fears of mixing the rela our relationship personal and with, with the work, we started to uh, adapt new guidelines and policies and procedures uh, to deal how to deal at home. And, and we, we put some rules to deal uh, at home and uh, at work. And finally, so, yeah, it's working so far. Mean, so so, so he, he turned out to be two in one. Yeah, husband. exactly. Yeah. Yes. No, great. And I'm glad you're able to separate between uh, the business and, and the personal family relationship. Rama, you've had a, a long uh, uh, entrepreneurial journey that started uh, very early. Can you tell us how, how did you get into it and what keeps you going? Uh, sure. So I, we started, I started um, the company uh, in 2004, so over 15 years ago, 16 years ago. Um, when I had my first born son and my friend Lamia Taba um, was living in London at the time she came to visit me with her son and we were talking about the, our frustration and you no know, tools um, there were no tools in Arabic language for children our age we both come video production backgrounds and so we said why don't we create videos for our kids so it was a very uh, uh, organic uh, idea um, and then we created this video and we had a showing in a cinema, a local cinema for friends and families. We distributed some flyers and nurseries and we had 300 people show up. And that's when we knew we were solving a problem. Um, but we didn't have any background in business. We had no idea that we were actually creating a business. We just thought we were following our passion. Um, and there were no tools for women like us uh, or even for young businesses who wanted any. There was no... There was no incubators, no accelerators. The, the startup scene wasn't at all, I mean, it was something Chinese to us. And yeah. then Oasis opened six years later in 2011. And uh, people said, Yalla, go join Oasis. Why don't you take this to the next level? And we were, we were so scared. We don't know anything about opening a business. We don't know how to do financial projections. We don't know how to scale, how to turn a business from you know, DVDs to something um, uh, something digital, something online. How do we take a local business in Jordan to something, you know, in the regional and global? So we had a lot of fear, a lot of resistance. Um, um, but we, you know, we said it was a, you know, a feeling, so we went for it. Um, and every step on the way, and you know, we had some obstacles, we had lots of insecurities, we weren't confident at the beginning. But what we did, and I think what was our biggest and what helped us the most is that we faced our fears. We jumped in. We knew it was risky. We were scared, but we took that step. Um, and we, we really, I mean, what helped us a lot also is talking to people, mentors, talking to other uh, business people, realizing that we're not alone. Everybody really is also as insecure, but they just don't talk about it. So when you start talking about it, you realize, you know, uh, you know, you know it's, it's their, their shared obstacles. Um, and we pivoted along the way many times and we were going to the closed shop many times, you know, we, we said to ourselves, we can't do this, no way, no, khalas, this is it, we, we're not, you know, we can't, but we kept pivoting and pivoting and pivoting until we found the right business model. And five years ago, we switched from a B2C to a B2B business and the company grew very quickly. We were able to fundraise. Um, we are VC backed now and, um, and we have offices in four countries. Um, in the Middle East. So yeah, I mean, it's, been, it's been quite the journey, to be honest. Uh, and, and, and you know, Amar, when you keep saying you've been there for a long time, long time, you know, I keep thinking like, I mean, sometimes it seems like it's a bad thing and maybe, you know, it took us a long time to get to where we are, but I guess we should always remember there's no formula. It doesn't mean you, know, you have to scale in three years or in five years. Different companies have different make genetic makeup and it, it's it's done differently i'm not saying Ahmad, it's you like even vcs when they come talk to us they say why did it take you so long to grow what you know so what what did you do wrong but it's not that we do wrong we grew and we learned along the way maybe we grew slower than other yeah. companies but um no, i think i think oh yeah that's a very good point and uh, and, and i keep saying a long a long time it's just because just being able as an entrepreneur to stand on your feet and keep the company running i think is is exceptional 
and the fact you kept pivoting and finding that uh, product or you know or service that the customers want because the customers themselves change as well. Uh, so I think I think no uh, salute to what you've been doing and 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 best of luck. Do you think uh, women entrepreneur women are face additional set of challenges than may their their counter mere parts as entre entrepreneurs? Are you asking me? I'm asking you. You doubt yourself. That's why you double and you come more. So it's it's boundaries you put on yourself, not necessarily that's from the outside. It's what it's it's your mindset. It's changing that mindset. You know, yes, I can do it. It's you know, yes, mama, my mom's gonna get upset, or uh, I might not be there for every birthday party, but it, it's okay. And it doesn't mean that I'm a bad mom or I'm a bad you know. So that there's the mindset. But I think also there are obstacles even now. I mean, now it's changing a lot, but there were obstacles even when we were fundraising. You could tell that there was much more excitement when there was a man fundraising or when it was a tech company and it was very like, you know, testosterone driven company and they would, you know, have these crazy projections and they're going to grow and exit. And, you know, whereas us, you know, female led businesses, we were very conservative and we were growing slowly. But then so you would see that the VCs or the, or the investors take shifting yani. So I think there's an obstacle in that, but I think there's more awareness now and there are much more, there's more focus on gender, uh, on investment with a gender lens, inshallah, yani, and this is what I see. Oh, great, great. Thank, thank you for pointing this out. Lamao, do you tell me, how do you, uh, when you have a male presenting versus female, when you look into their financials, and how do you evaluate? Uh, Amar, that's why I was smiling. I mean, she's absolutely right. Uh, we have, uh, you know, um, and it's a real, uh, real story without uh, mentioning names. So uh, we had two entrepreneurs uh, running two different companies. One uh, female led, the other is male led. Um, uh, same business model, different product. Uh, one has, one has a very, very, very big financial projections in terms of, you know, targets and, 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 and the other has something that's very, very realistic, conservative. Um, and, you know, um, they sit in front of investors, one uh, being us, and we talk about, you know, the budgets and we talk about the projections. Um, and when I asked them, how come, you know, why, when I asked her, how come you don't have, you know, uh, uh, bigger numbers, they're missing a couple of zeros. And she said, I would rather outperform and not overpromise. And when I asked him the same question, he said, I'm putting myself out there, uh, out of my comfort zone. I will be able to, I, I want to be able to attain and achieve. Uh, however, if I don't, what's the harm? I mean, can you see how, you know, we're, how we're conditioned and how we think? We are more literal when it comes to, you know, budgeting and, and putting numbers out there. But investors don't want to see that. They want to, you know, you need to sell them the dream. You want to sell them the big, big story. And this is not to say that she doesn't uh, uh, believe that she can actually perform. It's just a confidence issue. It's just, you know. She, she doesn't want to put a number that she cannot uh, 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 achieve. So, so what would be your recommendation as Oasis, for example, or, you know, I, I know you have your accelerator programs. So what would be the right direction? Would you keep them something that they're comfortable with or no, just push them uh, a little bit? Let me tell you, Armand, they ended up achieving uh, more or uh, the same numbers. I mean, they, she overachieved, he underachieved. But the issue is today you are seeing more female investors, more the female decision makers. So it, it brings a balance to the table whereby I understand where they're coming from and I know and I understand that with a bit of push from the investors, they will be able to outperform. Meanwhile, yeah. you know, a couple of years ago, we only had male investors that don't understand that uh, narrative. Um, and I think this is what's balancing it out. You cannot uh, expect uh, uh, you know, female entrepreneurs to change and have these big numbers uh, overnight. So it's maybe it's a gradual type of uh, progress. 
Yeah, great. And this sets the stage perfectly for you, Reem. So as since you were a, you had, you're a female male uh, co-founder, how did you go about putting the numbers? Uh, and, and how do you go about really, um, uh, uh, you know, going about, going about your business? In terms of, are you, are you aggressive? Do you try to hold back? Is he, is he the aggressive type? Who, who's aggressive? And Actually, it's, a, it's, it's opposite. It's me, the aggressive that we want uh, to do. And uh, my husband is the one who is uh, working hard to, <laughs> to keep me in place and to, uh, to manage things because he wants to keep everything organized. Um, and uh, okay, we want to be on track, we want to go fast, but at least we have to, uh, for example, um, uh, prioritize uh, our work now and uh, to be doing very well with what, what, with what we already have now, to be able to jump into another or a new market. So it's, yeah, it's, uh, um, I, I be, yeah, I believe. A mentor. So he is a respectful mentor for me and my husband as well. He knows us very well both. Uh, so he knows, uh, he, he keeps advising us uh, on a personal level on, and on the business level. And because he knows our weaknesses our, and our strengths, so um, our mentor advise us, advises us always, uh, for example, on the things who should do what and, you know, giving us directions uh, for so both of us. How, how important is it, do you think, uh, to have a mentor? I believe it made all the difference, <laughs> especially okay. if, if he is a mentor who shares, uh, you know, the, some values of what you have, and he believes in you, not only in you, but also in what you're doing. It really makes uh, the difference because uh, to have someone who uh, guides you, uh, you know, on, on, on a very micro level is really, uh, this what makes all the difference. For example, when we had some small grants and we wanted to, you know, uh, decide uh, what what would be the best way to use this grant to build for another uh, milestone and to build like, a, you know, one step towards sustainability. And then with his experience, he guides us and uh, we feel that we are really doing very well now because of his continuous guidance for the yes, three years. Yeah. So, and when, and when did you uh, have the mentor? When when should you, an entrepreneur, go and look for a mentor? At what stage? I believe from the as early as possible possible would be really great, especially if uh, he or she is a mentor. Uh, that you know uh, from before. So we knew our mentor before uh, launching Habayibna.net. And actually when, we, when I spoke with him about Habayibna before uh, doing Habayibna as it is now, and it was uh, for charity, for example. We wanted yeah. to do something because we keep, uh, it is the wrong perspective that we keep aligning the disability and special needs issues with charity and charitable acts. Okay. And then uh, when he asked us, he started asking questions. Do you want to do something sustainable? Do you want to do something scalable to be yeah. able to, you know, benefit more and more people and continue benefiting them? And then we started with him talking and talking and brainstorming. And then we found with my passion and my husband's passion, we realized that, okay, this is what we are going to do now as Habayibna, as it is now. Yeah. So I believe having him from the early stages um, helped us a lot, really. Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah, I think I agree with you. Having a mentor is important. Loma, you want to say something? Yes, I just want to add on Reem's point. I mean, um, we, we also, as females, we need to learn how to ask. Yeah. Uh, um, and I think, you know, um, everybody here can say that we are, it doesn't come natural to us to ask for help. It doesn't come natural for us to, you know, seek mentorship. I, I believe that even on an individual basis, it's it's not only the company that needs uh, mentorship. I mean, individually, we all need to have ment mentors earlier on, even when thinking about what are we going to do, uh, whether employment, whether it is, you know, our own startup, we all need to, you know, surround I 
advisors and the, um, yeah, but I want to add to that something, the mama, I don't know what you think, but um, because there's so much now more people in the ecosystem, you find mentors everywhere. And not all mentors are created equally. So I think it's very important also to trust your gut. I mean, you listen to them, a mentor or the, I mean, first you need to figure out who is the right mentor for you. Absolutely. Because yeah, I mean, we've had many mentors and some of them were really just, not only were they not helpful, they could have taken the business somewhere where it shouldn't have gone. No. Um, but it's also about listening to your gut. And talk to people, but trust yourself. And I think this is something you know, we, the, the issue of trusting ourselves and not listening to the outside noise. You have to always go back and you know, take a step back and look at the full picture. Nobody now you need to our business more than us. I completely agree. You can, they can't sway you here in this direction. It's just advice that you listen to and it opens your you know, a horizon. But yeah, I completely agree, Rama. Yeah. Great. Uh, and in terms of uh, funding, uh, for example, uh, Rama, uh, do you, do you, how do you go about it? Do you think there's more funding available for uh, male-led uh, startups versus female-led startups? And how, how did you go about it to make sure you really get in the amount you wanted on the valuation you wanted with the right partner, really strategic partner or investor that will propel your uh, growth plan? Um, yani, fundraising for us was a very harrowing experience, especially when we raised last time, we, we raised around $1.7 million. It was our Series A. It was a very, it took a year. Um, and I was sharing um, with you last time, and one, time, one of the uh, VCs we pitched for, it was, a men of ten, it was a room of 10 men. And I literally had a panic attack. Uh, I usually present fine, and we've been doing this for 10 years, so khalas, it's become part of you know, the D, and I know how to present, but I completely froze, uh, and I broke into like cold sweats, so really, it was very, very intimidating, and it was the first time I realized the importance of having women in the room. I mean, if you have one or two people you're pitching to, fine, but when you have an IC of 10, and you're pitching to, it was really scary. So, um, but in general, the whole experience of fundraising was difficult and I wish I had more guidance uh, on how to do it. Um, we were very lucky. We have an amazing VC on board there from Egypt, Algebra Ventures, and we have great synergy. Uh, but it was it, it took some time to figure out who's the right partner because you, it, it's a delicate balance between finding a partner who understands what you're doing and believing in your mission and those who want you to grow quickly and want to, they only look at the bottom line. I mean, we are an impact uh, business. We, we have a social mission. So it's not just about money, but it's about improving literacy, improving Arabic language outcomes, improving connection to Arabic culture and identity. So it, it's, it's, it's multi-layered and it's important to have investors who believe in what you're doing. Um, but I mean, yeah, it was not difficult to get the valuation you wanted, to get the partners you wanted, to get the money you wanted. It, it, it's, it's a journey. And I think everybody has their, their own experience. Do I think uh, had I been a, a male that company would have been easier for me? I don't know. I think it's very difficult to generalize um, because again, we're in the education space. So education is not as sexy as FinTech, you know? So it depends. It, it, it's, it's so difficult to generalize, but I think in general, you can say it is more challenging to, to fundraise as women because from what you see, like from deal flow, you don't see as many women um, who are VC backed. I think it's improving now, um, but when we were doing it, it was a bit less. Yes, and, and we're hoping, Yanni, uh, sessions such as these would start supporting women to, to have that confidence to enter the you know, entrepreneurial uh, world. Uh, Reem, how was your uh, fundraising experience? It was very challenging. <laughs> it was very challenging because, um, you know, um, and again, uh, the, the feedback what, that we took, what, that we used to take all the way from uh, those he, whom we fundraised from, it was really uh, very, very helpful and useful. So we started out uh, from uh, a prize from one of the banks here, and it was uh, $3,000. So because of our experience, me and my husband, we could utilize it to launch the website, you know, using one of the templates online, and uh, offer 100 videos uh, with, and we started with the network that we had from our own network. And uh, then we, we went to a crowdfunding campaign. It didn't, it didn't go very well as we expected, 
but uh, and we raised uh, with this uh, like you know an amount that we could utilize to jump to the the next milestone and then we had the dubai expo 2020 uh, because we we saw like we fit, we we could tick so many boxes and because we already worked uh, very well we had the proper documentation of all our work and um, you know of all our impact we were qualified to get um, you know, the grant from them. And here came our mentor uh, and we designed the proposal and even the project in a way that once the grant ends, then how we can become, start becoming sustainable by our own. So yes, it was challenging, but yeah. Okay, and then, and then when you're pitching as well to potential investors, were they mainly male or there were female part actually, of the decision they, they making? Were, no, they all were males actually, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> they so all so were, we, need, yeah. we need to start in, injecting. But do you know, there is something, but there is something that really boosted, uh, you know, my abilities a little bit in, in pitching and in talking yeah. to investors because um, because coming from the nonprofit sector was a little bit uh, challenging for me, you know, to be, suddenly to become in the VCs and uh, raising investment and becoming a, a, a social uh, enterprise. But in 2017, uh, I had a program, uh, a training program in Sweden uh, for uh, six months, and all the mentors and trainers were women. It, it was a program for women from the Middle East. And they trained us on, um, you know, how to build a, business, a sustainable and scalable business model for our social business. So seeing, you know, all these women <laughs> suddenly, you know, all of, a, all of a sudden being surrounded with all these women. And I said, okay, wh what is it? Diff I know it's different between Sweden and here, yeah. but uh, we really can do something. I, as a woman, I really can do something. So I came back and I decided to try and do something. And... No, great. And then that gave you a, a boost of confidence of what uh, you could do and what women can do in our part of the world. Yes, exactly. And, and, and it's really, this is why it's really important to see role models. And they help us to know more about, okay, even I, have, I want to see, I, I want to look at a role model. What exactly I like about this role model? What, how I can be, not, like, not, speci not specifically like this role model, but how can I be really unique in my own way? And uh, there we learned more about the self-leadership and, you know, uh, they focused a lot on the skills as not as much as, as being a woman. So it's being a person and they always, I remember one of the notes that we got from them, we used to introduce ourselves for so many trainers and, you know, um, uh, and coaches in the program. And most of us were moms or uh, 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 all of us were women. So we used, to, for me and other, the other few moms, we used to introduce ourselves, I'm a mom of two, I have so and so and so. <laughs> so they pointed out like, why don't you introduce yourself as an entrepreneur? Not as a woman, not as, as an entrepreneur who is having a mission. And then to focus on the skills and focus on the journey itself and you know, see yourself as a person. And here we, and there we, where we learned that we really, as, as uh, women entrepreneurs, we need to change the things that we tell ourselves. Like, instead of saying, uh, I'm a woman, no one would invest in me, how would I get a chance? Instead, we, we have to say, like, I'm an entrepreneur, I, do, I want to do so and so, how can I get it? What are the skills that I need to get there? That's so, right. no. yeah. Very good point. I mean, Loma, uh, yeah, to what uh, Reem is saying now and what you said, hidden talent, how much is it when you have these accelerator uh, or any type of program at Oasis 500 is, which, how much is it is to really enhance their skills, whether, you know, how to put a financial statement, how to read it versus really uh, reconditioning them uh, to tap into their, their talents and skills that they have with, uh, within them. It's, uh, it's, Omar, it's both, but we don't have a specific gender lens because we're opportunistic, right? So we're a commercial fund that wants to invest and make money. However, the balance of having females and males in our portfolio makes our returns much higher or the probability of our returns much higher. And that's why we work with them equally on skills, how to pitch, how to network, what to do. We link 
them. We do these linkages. Uh, and, and one thing that I wanted to add on the previous point, I fundraise as well. As a fund, I go to the market and fundraise, and it's really, really challenging. However, I think it's more of a mindset. It's more of a, a, the perception that I'm going to go and fundraise and it's going to be challenging. So this is uh, also changing. But one point I want to add is maybe even not at dream stage, a trauma stage when she's doing series A and series B, it becomes more challenging because it's, it's, a, it's a relationship type of, of fundraising whereby guys can go out with you know, their potential investors and you know, have a drink at the bar. You know, and it's all about personal relationships. And sometimes it's more difficult for us to do that. And, and here I would say also it's a mind around that. Uh, and it's, it's really, really, it's all about confidence. It's all about putting yourself out there. I, and I don't really believe that we need separate vehicles to be able to encourage these females to apply. I think that they can apply. They are eligible. But it's, but it's how they're thinking. Okay. No, yeah, no. I wanted to add one thing to this. Um, one of our investors from the very beginning were Wayne, Women Angel Investment Network. Um, they're a gender lens based um, angel investment arm uh, network in Dubai. And they now uh, have become Mindshift Capital. So they're a VC also in Dubai, but, uh, but with a gender lens. Uh, and one thing to always remember, you know, just because you're female and there are these female investors doesn't mean that's enough. I mean, you have to be hardworking, you have to bring numbers, you have to be sustainable, you have to grow. It's, I mean, it, it, they, they put as much pressure on you as, as other VCs. It doesn't mean if they're gender lens that they're softer, but they just maybe, uh, when, they, when, when you speak with them, you feel more at ease, yeah, I mean, less on the defense, because with male investors, you have to keep proving, 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 you're trying to prove yourself all the time. But with female investors, it's, it's just a bit softer to, to pitch and, and maybe they're, they're better listeners. Maybe they understand the pain more. Um, but at the end of the day, they all want the same. They want you to grow. They, they are looking for a business that will generate money for them. Uh, so they drive you just as hard as the, as the, as the men do. So and what do you think, um, Rama, in terms of um, supporting the ecosystems? If women were, had certain roles or positions, how would that push women more into uh, the entrepreneurial world? Yeah, you mentioned you see them, seeing them in uh, like uh, investment committees, for example, uh, that would support. Where else uh, they could also add, add value along the way? I think board members, it would help uh, on the board. I mean, our board is 50% women, but definitely I learned so much from Heather Heather Henyan, who is um, one of our investors through Mindshift Capital, uh, on how to run a board meeting. What is it that I need to present? Um, how to manage uh, the board members? Because you, yeah, I mean, it is it is a delicate balance. Um, also, like Reem said, role models. It helps to talk to other women and to realize, you know, it is tough. It is not. I'm not alone. It's not just me in this, you know, silo. Uh, there is a community of, of of people who have also been through the challenges that I'm going through and it's okay. And, and, and these are ways to, to overcome them. And, and if you're feeling bad or down, it's okay. And it's good to have that support um, because it can be very lonely. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. And, and I, even Anna, when I go to these Endeavor events, for example, in Jordan, and there are all these men who run, you know, and very few women. And I'm always like, all the women, they can't, you know, and it's, it's I mean, but you know, I, I just go, I put myself up there, whatever it is, I'm just going to go. I yeah. And that's only, uh, like a woman, that's, that's I want us entrepreneurs. We all have to, we always have to put ourselves out, out there and we're looking every second. Uh, Loma, what, what are your thoughts on this? Um, on, on networking events in particular, I laugh because you know, some of the male entrepreneurs are, you know, from the inside, they're so scared, but they just 
something in them makes them go up to people that they don't know. <laughs> Absolutely, and they just introduce themselves. And you know, we uh, you know, were more reluctant, and it's difficult because you know, like Rama said, it's mainly uh, males that are in the room. Um, but but again, Amar, uh, today we're seeing more females on on board. We're seeing more females. Uh, what we want to see is more females. I, I promise you that females can scale and can do it. It's just that they're not putting themselves out there. And I say, just, you know, try, 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 try. And I, and I know so many of them that, that want to, but are so reluctant because of this work-life balance. And I feel that, you know, as a mom, uh, I don't want to look back at my life and, and say, you know, I didn't do anything with my life that's luma. Uh, I, you know, it's only I'm a mom. And obviously, I'm, I'm happy to be a mom. I love them so much. But I mean, this is not my identity. I have other things yeah. that I want to do as well. And this is where I encourage everybody here and everybody listening to just, you know, think about the future. Think about how, how your kids are going to look up to you, you know, what you can do uh, and the change that you can actually uh, make in this world. No, good point. And it's our job really to develop and evolve this, this region, the Middle East region. You know, we have a, a long list of issues and problems and there's so much we can do uh, to, to raise the bar for us and for the generations to come. Uh, Reem, uh, uh, I'll, 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 so we're running, we just have a few, six more, seven more minutes. Reem, I'll ask you, um, what, uh, what would you do differently? What do you do differently knowing what you know now if you're going to be starting a company? To worry less. And also to, to uh, not to be uh, as afraid as I was in the beginning. Um, and, um, you know, to... Uh, to learn more. So I believe uh, that, you know, uh, being an entrepreneur is also a journey of uh, not only growing your own business, but it also gr to grow uh, as an entrepreneur as an, an, as an a person. So I believe like um, developing more skills and uh, learning faster, uh, because sometimes it took me a while to learn things uh, that we had to do uh, or, or to take some steps uh, I, I used to be excited also in the beginning, for example, uh, if you wanted to do this, to work this project with this part, uh, a potential partner and to be so excited and I just want to make it happen and I forget to work, to do all the work <laughs> that I had to do at that time. So I, yes, I believe, yeah. Um, and I believe that um, uh, I spend so much time uh, or some time uh, in, um, you know, looking at the glorious, uh, uh, institutes and uh, chasing the glory of uh, some projects or some potential partners that I thought would add to us uh, and to uh, our work. Um, but we wasted time and effort, like, you know, mm -hmm. chasing them. So, uh, you know, I believe now, you uh, know, is uh, after knowing myself more, after knowing what we doing more uh, I believe uh, the more that I am treating myself and my business as a valuable uh, enterprise others will respect it and will deal with it so but if we go in just to chase opportunities thinking that this is the only opportunity that I'm going to have it's it's not and uh, yeah I believe that uh, I can't be anywhere and uh, with with, uh, with everyone and everywhere so now we we are being more selective and more you know reflective we reflect i reflect more and more now <laughs> and, oh, and what is happening what has happened and uh, even when i'm stressed out and i don't know what to do i just pause and take a deep breath and i start asking myself questions why what and how what would be the alternative yeah so yeah. you're set, you're setting to set uh, uh reachable goals to manage your time uh differently analyze the uh opportunity or the situation yes. Yes. No, it's great, great. Rama, from your end, what what would you what would you do differently? 
Oh, that's such a difficult question, by the way. <laughs> because because in, I, I always think in 10 years, when I look back, will I, would I have done something differently? The problem is you don't know where you're going to be in 10 years. If, I'm, if, if you know, we continue to be, inshallah, growing and a success, of course I will say things, but what if not? Anyway, so what would I do differently? I think I would definitely have a technical co-founder. I think this is something that's very important for tech companies. Um, I think I would be very careful hiring the early hires. At the beginning, when you're an idea and you just want anyone to believe in your idea, you kind of hire haphazardly and then they become legacy employees. And I think that's very dangerous. I think it's important to be careful about who you hire, even if it's at the very beginning. Um, and I think maybe... Um, but, but these are these are very good advices for anyone who wants to start, to start a business. These are spot yeah. on. Yeah, I, I think these would be the, the, the best, you know, hire right and get a technical co-founder. And, um, and I guess, yeah, I mean, don't be afraid to pivot. I think it took us time to pivot. It took us time to say, okay, let's throw in the towel and try something else. Um, but otherwise, I, th I don't think, I think, uh, I think we're growing. I think, I think I would do it again with all the mistakes. Because that's how I learned. I mean, I learned through failing and I learned, I learned through the mistakes we, we've made. And that's how I've grown as a person and as a business. Great, great. And, and Luma, what would be your, your advice to entrepreneurs, you know, that uh, uh, you guys are recruiting or are p pitching to you? What, what would be your top three advice? Um, learn from your mistakes. And Reem mentioned something very important, reflect reflect on you know always after like board meetings everything reflect on what went wrong how you can make it better reflect on your confidence level it's so important um my my second advice would be um listen you know more than you think you do trust me you do just trust yourself um uh, and have that confidence because i'm sure that if you speak up you'll do wonders it's just the you're, you don't have that enough, you know, uh, push that's needed. Um, and again, just get out of your comfort zone. Uh, great things happen when you're not sitting where you're supposed to be sitting. Uh, put yourself out there. Um, and this is what I would do if I would do, do things differently. No, I think one, more, one, one more thing maybe as women, and no, be, and no be kind to yourselves. Yes. Give yourself a clap and No, Luma, I agree with you. Just we, ha you have, we have to challenge ourselves, male or female, get out of our comfort zone, because that's the only way we grow. That's the only way we learn. And, and then we discover the new skills that we had that we never knew existed in us. So no, um, uh, I think this is, this is great. Uh, thank you so much all for, for, your, for your time, for your insights, for sharing these stories. Um, it's now, now time now to introduce Shamima Parveen, the co-chair of Thai Women uh, in Thai Dubai, who will be into discussing this part. actually to lift all the other women up as well so appreciated quite a bit um, so I'm just going to take the last 10 minutes for the benefit of the audience who haven't heard about um, the pitch competition and about Thai women just to be able to run through so uh, I mean for you as well so just give me a minute let me just share my screen and uh, so Thai women, um, so the mission is of Thai women is to embrace, engage, and empower women entrepreneurs across the globe, irrespective of any stage of their entrepreneurial journey. And uh, we have built our programs based on six pillars. And a lot of the aspects that you mentioned earlier, you will see them reflecting in here. It is through continuous learning, it's through mentoring, and access to funding, and scalability, providing a safe space for women through an, and a community, which is also very important to be able to bring all of the women who are maybe aspiring to be women entrepreneurs, or maybe in the early stage to be able to get them to the same level as everyone else. 
And that's really how we have built our programs. And what are these programs? And like we stay true to a vision, it is uh, built for entrepreneurs across all stages. And uh, sorry. Uh, so our flagship program is the global pitch competition, which I'll be talking about in a while. But around the global pitch competition, it's just not about winning the grand prize money, but it's about the one-to-one -one mentoring our winners get in order to be able to prepare themselves for the global pitch among 40 other women who come from all over the world. And also, it is not just about the winners. It's also about the runners-ups. And we are very glad to have Reem here, who was the runners-up last year for the MENA program, who get to attend the accelerator workshops and boot camps for the next two, three months. And these are conducted by top leading experts and practitioners on topics that are related to go-to-market strategy or on funding or on building a brand as for your personal brand. So we want to be able to provide not just opportunities for the winners, but get these runners up to the next year as winners as well. And apart from that, we run actually monthly programs on these topics. First is actually called a Connect Series. Now this actually is a program for investors as well as entrepreneurs who have done exits. Now these investors would come in and talk about what do they have to prepare to do an exit? What is the process that they went through? and uh, or even to be able to access funding. What do they need to look at? All of these aspects that we want to be able to share with women who we see investors come onto these panels as well to talk about what do they look for and how they have worked with other companies as examples to be able to give funding. So this gives these entrepreneurs who are looking to scale an idea of how they should prepare and what they could uh, go through. And we run a series of active learning workshops. And we talked about wanting to continuously learn this. The world is changing so fast, not only in terms of technology, but in new business models, for example. And how we can learn and improve ourselves with newer ideas is something that we bring through these active learning workshops. And like the term means, it is active learning. They're not a series of PowerPoints aimed at a passive learner. These are involving the learners through smaller workshops so they can take back with them something to implement in their own workplaces. And last but not the least is one of my favorite programs right now is the Open Mic Night. Um, so here we talked about actually earlier on about confidence, about women feeling have an imposter syndrome. And these are all natural aspects and not only of women, but of many yearly entrepreneurs. So these are primarily aimed at idea stage, concept stage, and maybe even early stage entrepreneurs who want to be able to present themselves to a group and get feedback. Feedback is so important for us to be able to grow our ideas and business further. So the, here they get three minutes to do a pitch and with a specific ask at the end of it. And the ask is not only for funding. It could be, I'm looking for a co-founder. I'm looking to scale my business. This is my idea. Can you give me your suggestion? I'm looking to pivot. Rama talked about pivoting a number of different times, and that is the nature of business nowadays. Is that, so I tried this out and now I want to pivot. What could be our uh, inputs? So the audience has in, included of a number of mentors and investors and, and a marquee speaker, and anybody can come in there and give that. So this is a safe space for women, judgment-free to be able to get these ideas and grow. And so this is a series of programs that have been crafted thinking in mind of a vision and mission and addressing the pillars to be able to build a community that grows together for women. So let me talk about the pitch competition now because that's what is looming ahead in the next uh, two weeks. So we are in the second year of the pitch competition. The first year was a great success in spite of being the year of COVID as it's begun to be called. And now in 2021, we have grown to have more than 40 plus women from around the world coming in to participate in the finals. So how does it work? The applications are open. Uh, anyone who is a women founder or a co-founder are open for application. So if you're a co-founder, uh, but the pitching is provided to the women co-founder only. 
So for early stage and late stage, so it's less than three years, received initial funding, has an MEP, and in a late stage, it be less than seven years, because we want to give opportunity for <clears throat> companies and women founders in this space who need that funding to be able to grow, or not just the funding, the opportunity to learn and network to be able to scale further. And now if we actually last year, we had one MENA winner and three MENA runner-ups. But we decided actually, we're looking at the demographics, we're looking at MENA, we talk about 450 to maybe even 500 million people. And it's just unfair to select one winner. And we have such a growing, thriving entrepreneurial ecosystem and women are becoming more participative. Uh, we, I mean, there is said that women hold up half the sky. So we want to be able to give that opportunity to uh, uh, individuals in different countries. So we will have one winner and three runners up from each of these regions and countries. So taking in the space uh, or the area, we have come up with this. So one from UAE, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Levant, which includes Jordan and Lebanon, and then, then the rest of the GCC and the Middle East. So this gives opportunities for more women to get to participate in the finals and become runners-ups as well. So why apply? Mentoring by global experts, participation in the accelerator workshops, networking from investors around the world, and access to VCs and angel investors, PE firms, apart from obviously the prize money which goes to the winners. So the phase is right now, we are open for applications. And uh, Pavani, if you can put the uh, link on the chat for everyone to copy and uh, link to. We close applications on the 15th of July. Uh, we would shortlist applicants by the second week of August, and we will invite the top 12 to come in and do an online pitch on the fourth week of August. And that's the pitch that Reem did last year. We had another 11 uh, participants in there as well. So out of this, we will select one finalist and three runners-ups for Jordan. And the next phase is the winner gets access to global run boot camps and chapter in an other case, YSS 500 led mentoring as well, so that they get a better opportunity at winning in the finals. The runners up are also as much involved in the program through the accelerator workshops. And the winner pitches in the global pitch competition in October. And this year, we have a much bigger platform for these uh, finals because it's going to be in JITEX and it's going to be the future stars of JITEX, which is actually a startup platform, which as it brings in a lot of investors coming into that part of uh, JITEX. So this is going to give them access to not only our program, but also access to a larger networking opportunity. Just very quickly, uh, last year winner was Praxi Labs from Egypt and uh, runners subs was uh, Habibna Reem from Jordan and Monkeybox from UAE and BOT from Lebanon. And uh, it's been uh, very gratifying to see all of them grow and participate. Like I'm very glad to see Reem getting additional funding and Monkeybox actually, uh, she, uh, uh, Rana became a Cartier Women Fellow this year, which is really very nice to hear as well. And BOT continues to provide the much needed services in Lebanon, as we all know how the country is going through a change at this point in time. So we are wanting to have more such winners with us. And so looking forward to your applications and supporting all of the women entrepreneurs out there who are looking for support and scaling. Thank you. So I think we've come to the end of the session. Um, I want to take an opportunity to thank uh, Omar for so ably having a great conversation flowing with such enterprising women. Thank you so much. And uh, Luma, Rama, and Reem, thank you again for your contribution and your frank and candid uh, conversations. And we look forward to interacting with you all further. And to all the other women out there, we look forward to you all being part of the Thai women community and be contributing towards your success and your growth. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye-bye.